the Gospel of John, chapter 12 and verse 12. John 12 reads, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had, been, that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the reading of God's word. Well, good morning, uh, Ruby. Thank you very much indeed for that clear reading. And thanks to all of you for praying about uh, our search for a new building. Uh, as you know, the clock is ticking somewhat, and uh, we would like to be in new premises by the 1st of May. Uh, two new opportunities arose this week, and uh, we'll be pursuing those in the course of the coming days. But do keep praying about this. Um, the, uh, the echo of our brothers and sisters around the corner reminds us that it would be good to be in more um, isolated and a quiet setting. Anyway, in any event, um, let, let me commit our time to the Lord in a word of prayer. Loving Father, we ask that you would open the eyes of our minds this morning, that we might see truth and reality as you want us to see it and that we might live in the light of it. For Christ's sake. Amen. Well, do please keep your Bible open at the passage which Ruby read for us. Um, I do think it will help you to have the text in front of you, and not least the very last sentence in verse 19, where it says, Look how the whole world has gone after him. I wonder if it occurred to you as those words were read that actually what we're doing here this morning is a kind of confirmation of the truth of that statement. There are a number of different nationalities gathered here this morning and that's just a tiny reminder to us that the whole world has indeed gone after him. Um, I understand that the most dramatic physical explosion that has ever happened on planet Earth occurred in August 1883. Uh, the volcano Krakatoa between Java and Sumatra erupted. And the explosion was heard well over 2,000 miles away. But the spiritual explosion set off by the last week of Jesus' life on earth is infinitely greater than that. Uh, the sound of it has reached not just 2,000 miles from Jerusalem, not just as far as Europe or North Africa. No, the entire planet is still reverberating with it more than 2,000 years later. And even if you're not a Christian and you would not include yourself in the worldwide company of those who do follow Jesus, I think it's rather hard to dispute the fact that Jesus occupies the number one position in human history. 
Now, originally, the Pharisees spoke the words in verse 19 in sheer desperation. They didn't count themselves among his followers. But what they said has proved more true than they could possibly have imagined. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I think in the technological West it's obvious enough because nearly every time technology has taken a step forward in communication, Jesus has been the focus. So, for example, when uh, printing was invented uh, more than 500 years ago, the very first book off the printing press was the book in which Jesus is the main character, the Bible. What about films? Well, the first cinema was opened in 1897, and uh, a year later, the first film about Jesus was released. Since then, 150 films, at least 150 films, have been made on the life of Jesus, including children's films and international releases, putting James Bond firmly into second place. Last year marked the 25th anniversary of the first showing of the Jesus film. Uh, That particular film is based on the Gospel of Luke. And since it was released, it's been seen in 238 countries and translated into 848 languages and dialects. At least 200 million people have said that they came to faith in Jesus after watching that film. And now, of course, with the internet revolution, uh, the gospel is reaching more people and more places than ever before. So if you do a a Google search, you will find that Jesus Christ has more web pages devoted to him than Cristiano Ronaldo, the most famous living sportsman, and Taylor Swift combined. It's sometimes said that Christianity is a Western religion. But in fact, the footprint of Christianity is much more obvious elsewhere. In 2015, 26% of the world's Christians were living in sub-Saharan Africa. The Pew Research Center in Washington says that by 2060, that percentage will have increased to 40%. So by 2060, 40% of the world's Christians will call sub-Saharan Africa their home. And every day, the church in sub-Saharan Africa is growing by 20,000 people. Every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that's happening. Worldwide, there are more than 2 billion Christians today. And that's not bad, is it, when you think back to the start of it all? Till the age of 30... Jesus lived in almost complete obscurity in a small town carpenter's shop. By the age of 33, he was already dead. So within the time that it takes us to complete a university degree, Jesus had done enough to turn the entire world upside down. Someone puts it like this, quote, All the armies that ever marched, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, all of them put together, have not affected the life of humanity on earth as that one single solitary life. Look how the whole world 
has gone after him. He is the king who claims the world. So how do you account for that worldwide influence? Well, the occasion that prompted the Pharisees to make that statement in verse 19 was Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Now, I have to say that was something of a surprise to me as I was thinking about it this week. Because of all the events in Jesus' life, on the surface, this doesn't seem to be all that significant. Uh, If we did a, a survey in Cape Town today asking people what they would consider to be the top five events in the life of Jesus... I very much doubt if many people, even inside churches, would include his entry into Jerusalem. But it's actually one of only three or four incidents in the life of Jesus that are recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they've all got it. So as far as they're concerned, no picture of Jesus is complete without this particular story. So you've got to ask why. And the answer lies in the fact that here, for the first time in public, Jesus is absolutely open about his identity as God's king. You see, before this, he'd kept it under wraps. But here, if you look with me at verses 12 and 13, he makes absolutely no attempt to keep it quiet. Verse 12, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he! who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Now the feast that's mentioned in those verses is the Passover, the Jewish Passover, which was the anniversary of the time in Israel's history when the Hebrew people had been set free from captivity in Egypt. They had escaped from the brutal rule of Pharaoh. But now, in this part of John's Gospel, they find themselves once again under the iron grip of a foreign power. This time it's Rome and uh, its brutal anti-Semitic governor, Pontius Pilate. And so for that reason, the Passover festival was a very highly charged time in the calendar, especially given the enormous crowds that gathered in Jerusalem. The uh, Jewish historian Josephus said that uh, a few years later, the population of Jerusalem at Passover increased from 100,000 to 2.7 million. So in our story, uh, the crowd that's in Jerusalem and the crowd that's been with Jesus witnessing his miracles, these two groups meet up. And together, they're shouting in support of their champion, he's the king of Israel. And of course, we know, don't we, that in their minds, that means he's going to throw the Romans out and set his people free. He is the king who claims the world. And notice that Jesus does nothing to silence their shouting. Uh, Up to this moment, he's kept his kingship quiet. He's spoken about it only privately. But in our story, he dramatizes it for the whole world to see. He's not just the the local boy from up north in Galilee. No, he's, he's much, much bigger than that. And as he enters God's city, he claims it as his own. 
Some time ago in the United States, three young men uh, got onto a bus and uh, there was an African-American sitting by himself at the rear of the bus. And these young men decided that they would um, give him a hard time because of the clothes he was wearing and so on. So they tried mocking him, they tried to provoke him. And they were reasoning to themselves, well, you know, there's three of us, there's only one of him, uh, we'll be fine. But the man at the rear of the bus, he he didn't retaliate. Uh, He just sat there quietly. And uh, when the bus reached his particular stop, he got up and he walked slowly to the front of the bus. And only then did the young men realize that he was actually rather bigger than they had previously thought. Much, much bigger. And as he passed those three boys, he gave one of them his business card, which revealed that the man they'd been trying to provoke was Joe Louis, the professional boxer. And in case you don't know, Joe Louis went on to win 11 world heavyweight title fights. The point of the story is that these boys had been in the presence of greatness without ever realizing it. And if you haven't done this before, it's time to realize that what was true about those boys with Jesus, uh, with Joe Louis rather, is infinitely more true when it comes to Christ. He is far, far greater than you think he is. He is the king who claims the world. And no wonder the Pharisees said the whole world has gone after him. But we can't stop there because Jesus is a king with a difference. Yes, he is the king who claims the world. He is but he is also the king who clashes with the world. Maybe you didn't spot that in verses 14 and 15. Just look at those verses with me, or listen if you would prefer. Verse 14. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. Now, friends, that is not the way that you would expect the king to enter Jerusalem. Uh, Donkeys simply don't convey an image of seriousness or authority. I think we all know in the West that in children's books, uh, donkeys are often a figure of fun, And who ever heard of a king with a worldwide empire riding anywhere on a donkey? Uh, In February this year, Queen Elizabeth celebrated her Platinum Jubilee. Uh, That means that she is the first British monarch to reign for 70 years. But in 70 years and countless state occasions... No one has ever seen the Queen riding a donkey. And it was just as strange in Jesus' day. Because processions in those days were normally military parades. So imagine for a moment uh, a Roman officer galloping up to the crowd watching Jesus come into Jerusalem. Uh, He's been to triumphal processions in Rome where they do these things properly. And in Rome, uh, the general would be seated in a chariot of gold pulled by stallions who would be straining at the reins. And behind him, there would be officers in highly polished armor carrying the, the trophies of the armies they'd defeated. And then behind them, there'd be a kind of motley rabble of slaves and prisoners in chains, a kind of public demonstration of what happens to anybody who takes on the might of Rome. But what would our Roman officer 
see if he was checking up on this disturbance on the road into Jerusalem. Well, he'd see lots of people for sure, but most of them would be poor peasants. And he would find it almost impossible to work out who was the centre of attention. And when he did find out, he would be thinking to himself, what, him? On a donkey? How absurd. So, can you see why I say that he is the king who clashes with the world? He doesn't come in splendour. You see, so much about Jesus on the surface looked to be very unimpressive, not least his poverty. He was born in a borrowed stable. Uh, He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And here he rides on a borrowed donkey. So it seems, doesn't it, if you think about it, that God's purposes are not served by a fleet of Cadillacs and an armoured escort. And it is important for us to grasp this morning that it is God's purposes that are the central issue in this story. That's why there's that little quotation in verse 15 from one of the prophets. Uh, It was made 500 years before this happened. And Zechariah said then, that God's king would enter Jerusalem not as a conqueror on a war horse, but on a donkey bringing peace. You know, if Christ's kingdom was measured in land, won in conquest by armies, I suppose we would expect him to come on a war horse. But it's not. God's plan, predicted hundreds of years before, was completely different. It was a direct clash with the world's way of doing things. So, if you look it up in Zechariah 9 later, you'll find that Zechariah continued by saying that when the king came, he would be gentle, not brutal, and that he would bring rescue not revolution, and that he would achieve all that by shedding his blood. It's interesting, if you read the four accounts of the life of Jesus in the New Testament, you'll often find that there were a number of events where Jesus had no direct influence on uh, whether those ancient promises about God's king would be fulfilled. It's one of the things that's quite striking about them. So 800 years before, for example, Isaiah said that Jesus would be born of a virgin. Well, quite obviously, Jesus couldn't have arranged that. A thousand years before, David had said that his clothes would be gambled for. Well, obviously, it was very hard for Jesus to arrange that, considering that when it happened, he was nailed to a cross. So God's plan was often fulfilled without Jesus actually doing it. But sometimes it wasn't outside his control. And in this case, Jesus knowingly and deliberately decided that he would take the path God had laid down for him. So with Zechariah firmly in the back of his mind, Jesus found a donkey, and powerful as Jesus was, he entered Jerusalem in weakness. And what lay at the end of that particular road? Well, within days, he would die in weakness as well and he knew exactly what that involved but seeing the cross at the end of it he chose to take that route now friends that is a direct clash with the ways of the world which never never encourages us to give ourselves 
gods in that way. The world always says, look after number one. And as a result, we refuse to go God's way. And what we endlessly do is we we push God to the edge of our lives so that we can carry on without him. Last year we had uh, a short family holiday in the Kruger Park. And uh, in each of the camps where we stayed, uh, there was a large map on the wall uh, showing you how to plan your route for the next day. And it was just rather striking that in each of those maps, the campsite was right in the middle. And uh, I understand that these days it's possible for you to buy a map for the particular area where you live with your home right in the middle. I quite like the idea of that. A map on the wall with our home, 45 Lismore Avenue to Kai, right in the middle of it. But I don't need a map that says that because it's the way that I live anyway. Because to varying degrees, all of us live in a kind of make-believe reality with ourselves in the middle and everything else, including God, at the edge. The Bible says we've all done it, I've done it, you've done it which might seem okay to us, except that this really is God's world. Jesus Christ is his king, and he does take center stage. So for me to carry on as if he isn't is a direct insult to almighty God. And if I carry on like that, I must face his judgment And in the Bible's teaching, that is a fate worse than death. It's actually what we all deserve. But it explains, doesn't it, why it was necessary for Jesus to clash with this world's values. It's why he went to Jerusalem, to the cross, to spare us that fate of judgment. And to die there just a few days after he entered the city. So please think about this in your mind. He was the most powerful person who ever walked on planet Earth. His miracles prove it. But he chose to die so that others might be saved. And friends, the New Testament everywhere warns us that Judgment Day is coming. I mean, why else did Jesus die? He he didn't have to do it, but he chose to do it because his mission was not to conquer. It was to suffer and to die. And the reason he did it, his motivation, was love. Love for you, love for me. Taking the punishment that that we deserve so that we might be forgiven. And if we trust in him, we will find that he has rescued us from disaster. So friends, where does all of that leave us this morning? Well, if Jesus is both the king who claims the world and also the king who clashes with the world, one thing is absolutely certain. No one in the world can be neutral about him. Everyone has to make a choice either for him or against him. So can I suggest that the totally illogical thing for us to do this morning is to go home after the service and say, well, we had a lovely time at St. Barnabas this morning, but do nothing about Jesus. Because God is saying to us, Jesus is king, and he has died so that we might be forgiven. And he tells us that we really do need to be forgiven because of his judgment. And friends, either it's true or it isn't. 
and I can't remain neutral about him. Someone, I think it was probably Woody Allen, has said, you cannot ride two horses with one behind. That's quite right, isn't it? So when it comes to Jesus, I must be either for him or against him. Well, in our passage, the crowd that uh, was cheering him came out in their true colours by the end of the week. Uh, They realised that Jesus clashed with their agenda. He wasn't the kind of king they were after at all, and they rejected him. What a tragedy, especially in view of what happened to Jerusalem 40 years later. That brief burst of enthusiasm they had at the start of the week for all the wrong reasons meant that the pendulum swung completely the other way by the end of the week so that by Friday they were crying, crucify him, crucify him, get rid of him, we don't want him. If only they had thought about it more carefully. Well, the disciples in verse 16 did do the thinking. And gradually, they did understand what Jesus was all about. And maybe that's the pattern for some of you this morning. Maybe it's time for you to really seriously look into it. Because Christianity does stand up to careful, thorough investigation. Now, if you're ready to do that... I'd like to give you a copy of this little booklet. It's called Resurrection, Fact or Fiction, and it's actually written by our friend Richard Cunningham, who some of you will remember was with us just a few weeks ago. And I think with Easter around the corner, there is no better time for you to be thinking about these things seriously for yourself. So at the end of the service, I invite any of you to come and get a copy of this booklet from me, to read it. And when you've read it, why not contact me and tell me what you thought about it? But for now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is beyond our finite minds to grasp the fact that Jesus has claimed the world by dying for the world. And yet we are just so thankful that he has, proving by his resurrection from the dead that the price for sin has been paid in full and that we can be forgiven. For anyone who might be thinking seriously about these things for the first time, we ask that you would open their eyes to grasp the extent and the wonder of your love for us displayed on Calvary's cross. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.